What up, what up, what up? It's Ibn Webb, Ib Webb, Karan or some. Got official thanks thing going down here. Doing Essex County all day edition. Got Tony Pierce coming on, Coach Pierce, East Orange native, you know, well, one of those Panthers from back when. Um, does spent the lifetime as far as just being involved in sports, football in particular, as far as through the coaching ranks, whether it's high school, college, you know, spent some time in the pros here. You know, family man, you know, solid solid individual here like i said just looking forward to just um get to know a little bit more about him I want to thank mr mccree for actually um mentioning coach pierce to me so i want to make sure i i state that as well too so um uh, without no further ado here just hold tight and i'm gonna get um coach pierce on hold tight hey hey hey, hey good evening coach pierce how are you i'm doing great how are you doing likewise great as well great as well Thank you, thank you for just taking some time out. I really appreciate this. Oh, anytime, anytime. And I know uh, we talked briefly, I know over the phone here, but I'm not sure, again, just to kind of little quick thing about this here. Like I said, it was something I started, you know, less than a year ago. And again, somehow done grew some legs in regards to just have an opportunity to talk to and particularly folks that, you know, grew up in my neighborhood, be it Exus County or what have you, that's going on to, you know, just live their lives. I mean, it don't necessarily have to be athletics, what have you. Obviously, a lot of it has been. But um, just those that, you know, um, I just love to just get to know a little bit about, you know, or what have you here. Just um, and actually those who are watching, you know, um, probably, hey, I remember Coach Pierce. I played with him. I coached against him. Et cetera, et cetera. So it's just one of those things. Here, like I said, I've been having a blast as far as just doing this meeting. Um, great individuals such as yourself, sir. And like I said, I'm just, I'm just delighted to have you on. I appreciate it. <laughs> yeah. And um, uh, even with that said, I kind of jump actually right into this here. This this journey of life for yours. I mean, where did it start at? Was it East Orange, or were you, you know, born somewhere else, raised somewhere, and it went over to East Orange? How how did it start for you? No, I was born in Newark. Okay. Born in St. Michael's Hospital right down down in Newark. Mm -hmm. and, uh, you know, my parents moved originally to Orange, New Jersey. So when I was a young boy, I was in the Orange uh, School District. I was with Robert Cole and Daryl Butler and those guys playing basketball hoops for Orange High School. Okay. Uh, when I was a kid, I played with them. But then I moved to East Orange in the fourth grade. Mm -hmm. Went to Lincoln Elementary School and junior high school. Went to East Orange High School okay. for four years. Mm -hmm. Always tried to follow my brother, Jerome. My brother, Jerome, was an all-state football player. And he is still today the all-time leading tackler in Dartmouth College history. That's amazing. Yeah. So, you know, having a brother like that two years younger is like, okay, what, what am I going to do? Mm -hmm. I got to keep up with this. So. Um, I was not advanced as he was, you know, and I was a smaller kid. I was a defensive back, quarterback, receiver, and uh, tried to just do what he did. So he was captain of the baseball team. I was captain of the baseball team. He was captain of the football team. I was captain of the football team, mm -hmm. you know, and just didn't know much about college, really. And um, a friend of mine, Jimmy Sims, actually played at Our Lady of the Valley. Okay. Jimmy played out of Gettysburg College in Pennsylvania. Jimmy ended up signing a contract, free agent contract with the Dallas Cowboys. Jimmy was a trackster. Mm -hmm. He's a lawyer out in California now, but Jimmy invited me out to visit Gettysburg and I visited out there. It was in the boonies, mm -hmm. you know, Pennsylvania, but they have fresh air, cows, green grass. Mm -hmm. And I felt good knowing that no one was walking behind me, you know. Mm -hmm. And I uh, ended up playing out there for four years after my career at East Orange and um, was captain out at Gettysburg, played in 41 straight varsity games, broke the interception record. Yeah. And, uh, you know, all that stuff. Eventually he had uh, played with the New Jersey Rams up in Montclair State. Okay. Oh, wow. Okay. Okay. Our home field. And we had guys, our quarterback played at Rutgers, our tight end played at Tennessee, mm -hmm. Tommy from Barringer played at Illinois State. So we, we had some players and three out of the four of our secondary signed in the USFL, the old USFL with 
Mm -hmm. I signed with the Philadelphia Stars. Some of them signed with New Jersey Generals, you know, and that stuff. So um, I got into coaching when I I visited East Orange and Frank Bonadice was the head high school coach. And he asked me what I was doing. And I said, playing ball in college. He said, next year, you're going to have a job with me. You're going to be coaching with me. And I was like, okay. Yeah, yeah. Just started coaching with Bonadice and then, you know, Erwin Sloan, who was the head coach at Clifford Scott for years, mm-hmm. coached East Orange. Then I was fortunate enough to be the head coach at East Orange for three years and just started getting this bug to coach at a higher level mm-hmm. and ended up having my first coaching stint at Bucknell University in Pennsylvania and went on to coach at University of Pittsburgh and West Virginia and Wake Forest and University of Georgia to help, help Alabama State in the SWAT. Yeah, so he yeah. is Jersey boy, light skinned Jersey boy, always got <laughs> back, coaching against Grambling and Doug Williams. I met Coach Eddie Robinson before at a convention, you know, all, all the way down here, coaching against Southern and all those schools. So I'm no longer coaching now. I'm a cool life insurance agent now. Okay. But my last coaching stint was down here in Savannah State. And, Stopped doing that and then actually fell into this acting stuff that's blowing up down here in Georgia. Yeah, I know uh, Tyler Perry done changed things down there in Georgia regarding the whole acting, especially with the studio. And I'm sure the acting bug, a lot of people probably in that area got it. I mean, especially probably some untapped talent. So you're acting as well? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Okay. You know, it's hard not to be down here and not get into it. You know, I fell into it by mistake. I was watching the news one day. And they said, hey, the Baywatch movie needs some background extras. And I was like, what's that? Mm-hmm. So I sent in my headshot and my height, weight, and everything. I got a call two days later. Someone said, hey, we'd like you to be a detective in our police office scene. I didn't know who was in the movie, didn't know what the movie was about. Yeah. So I go sit in this made-up police office. And before I know it, The Rock and Zach Efron come walking in. Okay, okay, so, yeah. I was like, this is crazy, you know. Here I am, one minute I'm coaching football, a couple of weeks later I'm with The Rock on set. Mm-hmm. So after that, you know, I sort of asked someone else about, hey, can I do more? And they was like, yeah, you can do more. So I was in Baywatch about two or three other scenes and then just started asking a lot of questions about what else I can do. So I was up in um, Queen Latifah's movie Star, TV show Star. Okay. Police officer there. Did a stint on CBS, the inspectors, as as a, a warden, jail warden. Mm-hmm. You know, and you just learn how to put yourself in and realize that if you want speaking roles, you got to start at the, at the bottom and do some short movies for SCAD students, Savannah College of Art and Design movies. So I did a couple of speaking role things and got my facial feature, got a, got a feature in a this movie called um, A Dark Place. Mm-hmm. And now I have an agent and I'm going after speaking roles, so. Yeah, so. no, nah, it's, it's definitely, and you mentioned down there, as far as that being a big deal, I know a lot of people just even, just throughout, you know, as far as get that actor bug into your point there, might start off with less speaking roles, but things progress. I mean, you gotta pay your dues, whatever line of work that you're in. And it sounds, and I'm sure from what I hear, like, you know, I have a couple of friends that actually do that. They love it. They love it. They have yeah. Yeah. Crazy it's crazy hours. It's crazier than coaching. <laughs> oh, I'm sure. I'm, yeah, I'm sure. But I know even with that though, it's just interesting now uh, that they'll do their do do their part and that's it. They'll get paid. And I mean, obviously sometimes checks come a little later, but they they love it. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. How long how long have you been doing what you're doing? As far as this hit, um, this year I started doing this. Uh, like I said, it's probably around January that I started. Um, actually, it's like you know what, and I and I've shared this before. It was just one of those things. That I said I'm gonna do something completely, like left of my personality here. And like I said, my wife is like, you don't even like to talk, you know. And now you're sitting here <laughs> talking to people. Well, I said, I was like, no, go figure. I was like, go figure. So you know, well, I had to uh, corral myself a little bit after each interview. Usually, I'll go talk to her and be like, I just guess what this person said that person said so I I try to tail it back swing it back a little bit here with my excitement especially she knows when the episodes are you know particularly talking to somebody from Jersey she knows how giddy I get this about Uh Jersey 
about Jersey in general here. It's interesting you said Orange. Like I was born in born in raised in Orange. I was raised in Orange. All so like I said, so I know some of those connections. And you mentioned those, obviously a few years younger than you, but you mentioned Rob Cole and those guys here. Like you know, I've heard those names throughout my whole life. You know, mm-hmm. especially growing up as a kid, just you know how how great he was, and you know, and also the other guys as well too. So like I said, right. this is this has been a joy. That's good. So, so you're finding out that new things still happen. Yes, yes, and I think even with the whole pandemic, I I, I said this right from the beginning of this pandemic. I was like, if people don't come out of this like you know doing something that they want, they love, they enjoy, just doing something totally different, or just reinventing themselves, or whatever the case is, you know, you know, wasted all this time because I mean it. it it gave us room to kind of just do different things. You mentioned the acting and me doing this or what have you. I think it's just your creative juices and just doing something different here. Like I just think, again, provided you had your health and everything, I think if if that was the case here, like you don't waste about 18 to 20 months here, you know, as far as like just do something different and or what right. have you. That's right. just, yeah. 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 Well, yeah. I've come to realize that, the Bible it says that we have not been given the spirit of fear, but the mm-hmm. spirit of power, love, and a sound mind. And you know, the the top dogs that keep rising understand how powerful they are, how powerful God made our minds. Mm-hmm. And that we don't say, I can't. I I, you know, that word, I can't stand that word. <laughs> you know, I can I people say I can't. I started selling life insurance almost the same way. A friend of mine, I, you know, my second son played linebacker in high school and play that linebacker out, out of the Air Force Academy. Right, right. It fell out there while I was in the Air Force Parents Club and a friend of mine said, hey, I think you'd be interested in something I'm doing. I said, what? I started taking this online life insurance course and thought it was pretty interesting. So I ended up getting my license to sell life insurance. So I've been helping families Yes. And doing that. And, uh, you know, you, you just shouldn't say no to anything. And I people... I hear people saying, yeah, I need more income. Okay, you need more income? I can help you get my life insurance. Oh, I don't want to do that. Well, that's why you're broke. Right, right. You say, I can't or I don't. And like you said, you didn't like to talk to people, but you're talking to people. Right, yeah, that's right. <laughs> you no, open up definitely. every door, open up every door. Mm-hmm. And it's interesting with the acting, and I can provide the information offline. I'm, Actually, one of a good friend of mine from East Orange, um, I don't know, Tabari Sturdivant, he's actually down in the in Atlanta area here. He's doing movies, everything here. I mean, he's actually wow. just wrapped up. He just wrapped up a movie as far as directing, writing, and everything as well, too. But he's directing? Yes, yes, yes. Oh, man, I passed my name to him. Yeah, no, absolutely. And he has East Orange. He's born, raised East Orange. Um, his, uh, his, his, um, he's the nephew of... Ralph Sturman, I'm not sure if you remember. I was just about to ask you as you related to Ralph. Yeah, that's his that's his uncle. That's his uncle. Okay, I knew Ralph. I knew Ralph. Yes, yes, yes. So I, I could have, definitely uh make that make that connection. That's not a problem at all. But he just he just wrapped up a, another movie. So wow, wow. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Now uh to kind of rewind back just a tad bit here, just growing up though, just your brother and yourself and the other siblings. Uh, yeah, my, my older brother and I was next, and then my, my sister Natalie graduated a couple of years uh, um, behind me. I had a twin brother, Nikki. He passed away after high school. And then my mom remarried, and I had another brother who was 10 years younger than me. I ended up coaching him at East Orange. He was one of my quarterbacks when I was the head coach at East Orange. Okay, okay. So he's, he's actually a pastor now, moving mm-hmm. from Colorado down to Florida. Mm-hmm. His name is Herman Hudson, so. Yeah, but those are all siblings right there. And it sounds like, you know, just you mentioned your brother being at Dartmouth and you, uh, as far as the college track, education was a big deal in your house growing up. Learning from my mom. My mom ended up getting her AA degree from okay. Bloomfield College. Mm-hmm. And when we were young, she would be doing her, she was young mom. She had my brother when she was 16, had me when she was 18. Okay. So I used to watch her all excited about making A's and doing her homework and everything. And you know, my brother was the A student. I, I used to be an A student. Then I started messing around in high school and went down a little bit. Mm. But yeah, um, academics were important in our household. Uh, um, Uncle Larry lived upstairs. He he was working with um, 
Pearson Oil and got was tired of getting his hands dirty and everything. Went back and got his degrees. Mm-hmm. My dad didn't have his degree, but he his nickname. My father's nickname was Kirby. He used to sell Kirby vacuum cleaner. Okay. Yeah, but my brother did real well up at Dartmouth. We had we had Mike Littlejohn from East Orange went to Dartmouth. Mm-hmm. Now we have kids from all from East Orange who've gone all over the place. You know, yes. same way as Orange and Barringer. And mm-hmm. you know, we have young men going all over the place and young women uh, going all over the world. So yeah. we're proud to be from East Orange. Nah, definitely, and it's limit. Excuse me, limitless as far as where we can end up at. And I think sometimes being some some individuals feeling like being confined to a neighborhood or whatever you just it's just a matter of just initially getting out of there and be like wow there's a whole nother world you know just realizing there's a whole nother world so i mean right. just, and just from your coaching alone like you don't had the opportunity to be all over this country here as far as provide your opportunities here but before just touch on the coaching thing even with um with high school and all that stuff i know obviously you had your brother you had the you know, follow his shoes here. Was it something you just took on or was it just like you obviously had no choice? The coaching part? No, the, uh, the playing part as far as, you you know, coming after well, your big no, brother. But, you know, we're old school. We were outside playing football in the mud, playing down at the Oval. Mm-hmm. The Oval yes. Park here mm-hmm. in the street playing tag football. But after, when it got warmer, we were up at the annex across from East Orange High School playing stickball, throwing that rubber ball against the wall, mm-hmm. trying to hit the ball out. Yeah. Then we were playing basketball. So mm-hmm. that's all we did. Yeah. So as you grew up, as I grew up, it was like it was just natural to keep playing. Um, I wish I had continued baseball in college. I ended up running track after football season was over. Okay. But, you know, that's what we did. That's what we enjoyed. And I probably went to college more for football than I did academics. Mm-hmm. You know, yeah. academic came later. I wish I it was reversed. Mm-hmm. <laughs> but um, yeah, that that's how it was. We were always out in the street doing something or trying to be like one of the older players, Clarence Turner, C.T. Turner, mm-hmm. um, Jesse Butts. Uh, Jesse used to grew up in Orange and moved to East Orange. Um, the Mumford brothers. Mm-hmm. You know, we had players that went to Nebraska. And um, USC, Charlie Hinton at USC, Steve Cowens was on Facebook with Steve. Steve played out Cincinnati with the Bearcats, who was right in the top five. They just got screwed by ESPN with, you know, where their ranking is right now with that college football playoff. But we've had people from East Stars go all over in academics and entertainment yes. and sports. Yes. You know, Dion Warwick, I remember when um, – John came out from good times, you know. Oh, the dad from good times. Mr. Amos, John Amos. Mr. John Amos. When I was the head coach at East Orange, I got a call from him. He said, hey, coach, this is John Amos. I said, yeah, right. Who is it? <laughs> Who's calling? He said, no, 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 it's John Amos. Hey, I'm not doing anything right now. I'd like to come out to practice and help out. I want to coach. I said, are you serious? He said, yeah, I don't want any newspaper people there. Please don't call anyone. I just want to come out and coach and Mm-hmm. Yeah, you know, and that, that that day he called our linebacker coach was out, so I gave him some linebacker drills. He came out and coached our guys up, you know. So just imagine someone like that just saying, "Hey, this is home. Let yes. me let me come out and coach." You know, yeah, that, John, that's all right. You know, so just a special place to grow up, mm. and just just thrilled to be from now. I'm just so sorry that now today I hate the cold. <laughs> so my, plan, my plans are not to move back north. I love coming up, watching the Thanksgiving Day games and all that. But mm-hmm. My plan is to be on that warm beach in Florida somewhere. Yeah, understandable, <laughs> understandable. How how was your teams back then, the East Orange High teams, not you coaching, but playing? How how were you guys? Mean? Well, my brother's teams were better. They went to the playoffs every year. I was a couple of years behind them. We didn't have a very good record. I think we went one in eight or something like that. And then. Mm-hmm. When after I got to Gettysburg and came back, we were coaching teams and kids that were in the playoffs again. Leon Bufa Cole went to Texas A&M. Jamal Williamson was a captain at Maine, University of Maine. Nate Rob Robinson went to um, New Hampshire. You know, so we were sending players out there. Simpkins went to Florida A&M. 
And we were sending them out there again. Look look at what Coach is doing now, these stars. They're undefeated, 8-0. I'm, yes. I'm, all, I'm on Facebook. You know, it's amazing. Amazing, amazing, amazing. So, but, uh, you know, coaching college football was exciting, but it's very draining. Seven, seven days a week, 12, 15 hours a day away from your family. You know, mm-hmm. it's exciting when you're at Georgia and you're beating Tennessee. Mm-hmm. Um, or we're at West Virginia where we were up on Notre Dame uh, pit we coached against Notre Dame. You know, so just imagine being on the field and you're coaching against University of Miami when they were good. Yeah, yeah. So it was a great experience, great experience. I was the head coach of the small division three college, Oberlin College in Ohio, as defense coordinator at Alabama State. Um, you know, so that was a great experience. But, man, looking back, that that really wears on you. Look Look at what's going on now. They just fired the head coach from TCU, the mm-hmm. guy who placed up. Yes. Built that place up, and they let him go after 20 years. You know, so they really don't care. It's all about what have you done lately because the new AD wants to come in and win right away and make a name for himself. Um, but the bottom line is just – Keep moving. Don't say no to anything because God's going to be opening up some amazing doors. I just added, I was just on the phone with my son. He, he was laughing because I said, hey, I added something else to my bucket list. And he was like, what, Dad? You're going to do some more sports stuff? I said, no. I want to be a professional ballroom dancer. Okay. Okay. It's like, I, I love to dance. Bachata, salsa. I've taken tango lessons, ballroom lessons. And I'm <laughs> like, okay, instead of fooling around with it, why are you Go for it. Go for it all, you know. Mm-hmm. I'm like, yeah, maybe I should put that on my bucket list. So whoever's listening out there, hey, don't say no. Yes. Never know what you're going to end up doing or where you're going to end up living or who you're going to end up being around. Forgive people who hurt you. Ask for the, the those that you hurt for forgiveness. Mm-hmm. And keep growing, keep moving on, keep positive people around you, get the negative people around you. It's like Lou Holt said one time, if you want a motivated team, get rid of all your unmotivated players. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, if you, if you want to rise, get rid of all the people who are you dragging you down. Mm-hmm. So, hey, man, but I'm proud of you for starting this. This is great. No, nah, I appreciate it. No, nah, no, nah, thank you, Ed. With, your, with the coaching, like, when did you know? I mean, again, I know some stuff is more business than anything else, but as far as when it was time to go somewhere else, I mean, was it just – I know each situation might have been a little different here, but was it a little inkling or something that you were told, like, hey, maybe I should start, you know, looking for something else? Um, some of it is just your head coach getting fired. Some of it is stupidity. Mm-hmm. You no, know, um, I was at Bucknell. I was a young coach when I, after I left these stars, and all of a sudden some guy heard about me, knew my college coach, okay. and called about the head job at Oberlin, which was a small Division three school. I probably should have stayed at Bucknell. Mm-hmm. Sam, Sam Rutigliano, the former Cleveland Browns coach, was a friend of mine. He was like, no, Tony, stay. I'm not sure they want to win out there. And I was like, Sam, you know me. I'm going to turn it around, blah, 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 blah. I probably right, right. But then all of a sudden, you're at University of Pittsburgh, and Johnny Majors gets fired. It's time to leave. Mm-hmm. You know, I go to West Virginia. Jim Caldwell, who was the head coach at Wake Forest, calls me up. He ended up being the head coach of the Colts and the Lions and things like that. Offered me a chance to be a defensive coordinator mm-hmm. on, on Division One A level. Yes. Yeah. So Those different things that happen. It's just called life. Okay. You learn to adjust and pray that you're you're not hurting your family too much and your kids are adjusting okay and all that other stuff. So. Yeah, and, and it's interesting you bring up the family piece. How much of a struggle was that? It obviously from moving from different states or what have you in short periods of time here as far as your kids. I mean, again, maybe them being adults looking back on it, they got a chance to see different things. But in the same breath, that whole friend network and everything else, you know, how was you mm-hmm. able to balance that and work that out throughout the years? Well, it was always tough, especially on the kids, because my oldest son, you know, we moved him a couple of times mm-hmm. when he, between junior high school and, and elementary school and stuff. And, and then when I got down here to Georgia, they were all in their high school ages, so I didn't want to move them anymore. I wanted, and all three of them were graduated from the high schools that they started, so that was important for me. Mm-hmm. It's a little easier moving when you're 
working with the larger university because they have the money to move you. My mm -hmm. wife had, you know, she is like, okay, they're going to pack everything up and move. Uh, yeah, that's what they do. Right. You know, that was good. You're at a smaller school. It's like you pack yourself. Mm -hmm. So it, it was rough. But I once when I was at West Virginia, we were playing Georgia Tech in a bowl game in Miami. And growing up in New Jersey, I never experienced that Miami weather during Christmas time. Okay. That bug hit me bad. Yeah. Like, okay, time to keep moving south, keep moving south. Where am I going? Keep moving south. But it's coaching is definitely hard on families. I don't wish looking back on it, anyone. Who's, who says, hey, you want to get married? Yeah, I'm a college football coach. Okay. It's just like marrying a CEO or someone, something else. Mm -hmm. They're going to be home. You know, mm -hmm. you try to have some time with the family, and there's a couple hours here and there and a couple of weeks off over the summer, but it's not enough. When I look back on it, I wish I would woke up early and did the life insurance thing earlier. Mm -hmm. Um. You know, but life is tough. Everybody has to provide. Right. You know, we're all professions, and especially us as husbands and fathers, we have, feel that stress of providing, making sure our kids have a warm room and food and all that stuff. So I think when we're doing the chasing, we're not really thinking about the most important thing. Um, you know, so it's a, it's a value learning tool, learning lesson. Mm -hmm. No, absolutely. And I'm, it's interesting as far as one thing you did mention, and I'm just curious about that whole experience with the with the Cardinals, the Arizona Cardinals. Um, was it like how, a was it like a and what's that? How do you know about that? I got a little nosy, not too much. I got a little <laughs> bit nosy, not not too much though. But uh, you know, what's like that was like a minority fellowship or apprentice yeah, or something minority, like that. If, yeah, as you know, things are been difficult in the past. In terms mm -hmm. of minority hiring. Yes. And uh, so they started the minority fellowship. Uh, really, the owners of the Steelers have been doing a great job working with Tony Junji to try to get more minorities hired in the NFL and the NFL level. And things have changed. You know, mm -hmm. we've had head football coaches at Texas, Texas A&M. There's a head black, you know, James um, is at Penn State now. Yes. Head coach at Penn State. There's a head black head coach at Stanford. Mm -hmm. So black head coach at Marshall right now. Mm -hmm. You know, so things have changed. There's a head black head coach at Michigan State right now. Right. Right. So, um, you know, things are changing, but that was just an opportunity to get some experience on the NFL level. Okay. See, if that's a route that I could possibly take. Um, so they're, they're still doing those types of things. That was a great experience. I did that when I was at West Virginia University. But a lot of it is just about who you know. Mm -hmm. You know, so sometimes if you're in college too long, you get pegged as a college coach. Right. When an NFL coach has been coaching in the NFL, and it is different. It is a different game. Mm -hmm. And they may not want you as you get older, because you're pegged as a college coach and so forth. So it's, it's still all who you know. No, no, definitely. What kind of things did they have you doing during, um, during that um, minority fellowship there? Was I'm it just sh coaching. shadowing folks or? Um, yeah, I was working with the uh, secondary coach at the time at West Virginia. I was a running back coach, but I've been the secondary coach at Bucknell and mm -hmm. Pittsburgh, Wake Forest and things like that. So I was just working with Larry Marmy, who was there at the time, secondary coach, and just helping him run drills, throwing the balls, running drills for him, um, being in the meetings with the players, mm -hmm. learning what their mistakes are and teaching them up and listening what Larry was saying to him and the difference between technique on the college level and the NFL level. Um, Aeneas Williams was there at the time, okay. who was an all-pro player and Hall of Fame player. Right. So it, it was it was just an excellent experience. No, I, I can I can only imagine again just having an opportunity to your point there. Um some coaches get you know labeled as there's only college coaches, but just to try to shake it up a little bit to learn some. I mean, I think that's just that's just growth and wanting to do something different here. Now 
your kids did they not to bring them involved but i'm just curious did they follow that as with regards to football and playing sports early on or they stayed yeah, away my, from it yeah my oldest son played high school football and then he eventually got into the uh jujitsu arena he didn't play in college he, he's a west point grad mm -hmm. and um He's a black belt in jiu-jitsu. He went down to Brazil and studied with the Gracie brothers, mm -hmm. flying, flying around the world now, working all over the place. My second son was an all-state linebacker here in Georgia and ended up being recruited by Harvard and the Air Force Academy and a couple of other schools, and he wanted the bowl experience. So mm -hmm. he led the team in tackles in 2014 out of the Air Force Academy. He's captain out there and ended up being defense player of the game against Western Michigan in the bowl game, mm -hmm. playing against San Diego State. He had a chance to play against Notre Dame. Yeah. You know, so he had a great career. He's a captain. Both of them are captains right now, one in the Air Force, one in the Army. And my daughter played uh, soccer, and she played volleyball. Really, soccer, ran a little cross country, and actually went to University of Georgia Law School. And is, she just applied for the bar and took the bar in New Jersey for the first time and pass it up there. Uh, uh, I thought you're trying to just keep everybody south here. Hey, I am trying to keep myself south. They <laughs> go they want to and be crazy if they want to. I <laughs> now, can you imagine when we were kids down here, if, it, if they even mentioned the word snow, they closed the schools. Right. Up there, schools were open and mm -hmm. we had to put on our boots and our coats and all that stuff, and then walking three feet of snow, stepping down and pulling the foot up mm -hmm. all the way over to Lincoln Avenue School on Central. I lived on Maple. Man, that's crazy. That's some crazy stuff. Ain't nobody supposed to be living in snow. Yeah, but unfortunately, I mean, you know, we, we still get it here. You mentioned... <laughs> You mentioned them bowl games, like this coaching and this being in that environment, whether it's the bowl games, the, the 80,000, 100,000, like as a coach, like what's that feeling for you? I don't care if you're an assistant coach or the heck, like just, I know it's still a little different from being an actual player, but just for yourself there, just getting into these, these environments, how was it for you? Well, it's great. The energy is always great. Mm -hmm. you, you come to realize in the SEC, they understand what big stadiums are. You yes. know, because when I was up in the, the old Big East, Syracuse Indoor Stadium was 50,000. Rutgers at the time was probably 35,000. Mm -hmm. West Virginia was large for us, was 70,000. Pittsburgh was 54,000. Then all of a sudden, you come down to South, and Tennessee is 106,000. Georgia's 90,000. Alabama's crazy. Mm -hmm. You know, you see how crazy the, the football is down here. Mm -hmm. You know, and then you learn that in Florida, it's so warm down there. These kids got spring ball, spring football with pads on, and they have a game they're playing against other high schools in mm -hmm. the spring yes. to prepare for the fall. Mm -hmm. You know, so it's a little crazy down here. Football is crazy, but it's a great experience. You know, like I mentioned, like coaching against Tennessee, coaching against Texas, Notre Dame, Miami, mm -hmm. Florida State. You know, some of the big schools really didn't go against anybody out west. None, none of the USC's, that would have been nice and things like that. But just the experience of going to a bowl game and knowing that, man, you worked hard and your team got the six wins to be eligible for a bowl game. And as a coach, it's nice because you get that extra bowl bonus. Yeah, you know? yeah, that don't hurt. That don't hurt. We got the rings. You get the rings and the watches and all that stuff. But And then we won the SWAC championship at Alabama State. Mm -hmm. So that that was nice to experience. Now at Alabama State, that's no small turkey either. Now they they we had eighty ninety thousand people when we play Alabama A and M in Birmingham. Those people filled that stadium up, yes. and believe me, they love you when you win, and they will curse your tail off at you while you're walking on the field when you lose. It, mm -hmm. It's crazy, you know. <laughs> you know, you try to be professional and somebody's throwing those cuss words at you and you just, hey, be professional, just walk on the field, don't look at them. And one of my players, Chuck, remember Chuck came up to me, put his shoulder around me and said, put his arm around my shoulder and said, hey, coach, did you hear what that guy's calling you? <laughs> I was like, yeah, Chuck, I heard him. Just keep walking, brother. Just keep yeah. walking. <laughs> so it's, it's all good. It's all good. And, I'm I'm never never counting coaching out either. If I if I find some college team, 
near the beach down in Florida. Yeah. Hey, yeah. hey, call my number. Yeah. You sure the wife, she going to let you do this again? Yeah, I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and, uh, she got you out. You out of it now. So uh, it might be a little tough getting back into that. Yeah, I know. I know. I, I don't need to do it again. Mm -hmm. I just need to be on the dance floor at the beach and selling my life insurance. Mm -hmm. There you go. Now, also, you mentioned obviously Alabama State. Like, how you feel right now? The direction of HBCUs, how they going as far as the recognition? This is entirely long overdue, and as far as some of the, you know, a lot of the schools and the HBCUs in general being highlighted. I was like, how do you just feel about the direction of it now nowadays? Well, the direction is going good. I think it's good, definitely getting more exposure. Mm -hmm. TV and a lot of ESPN games and things like that. I think uh, one thing they want to try to do, and this may never happen because the money on the Division I level is just so big, and every year Alabama's building new locker rooms and Tennessee's building new stadiums. I don't know if they'll ever catch up um, with the facilities. Okay. If they can, like Alabama State had a new stadium about 10, 15 years ago, you can get some recruits, but you gotta you gotta have the toys. The kids come out of high school looking for the toys, mm -hmm. the new locker room. Where's you gonna put my name? How are you gonna market me? I want to make it to the league and all that other stuff. And so it's a good deal. I'm not so sure about the hiring of inexperienced coaches just because they have a name that they played in the NFL. Mm -hmm. Because the one important thing that a head coach has to do is be able to coach his coaches. Yes. And I've seen inexperienced coaches get jobs just because of the name. And then when things went wrong, I saw that they didn't know how to coach their coaches because they didn't have the experience. Mm -hmm. they tell them what to do technique wise or game plan wise or anything like that. But you know, I'm pulling for Dion. He's doing a good job down there. Jackson State is winning. I think they'll go to the SWAC championship this year. And I know that, uh, you know, Eddie George is what the head coach at Tennessee State right now. So I wish those guys well. It brings credibility or a name to the school and gives a little bit more exposure. But I also feel bad for the guys that I know who have years and years of experience who got fired to let those guys have jobs. Mm -hmm. So how, how about those guys? So, you know, life is crazy. People are crazy. And you just got to keep getting up the next day as long as God puts some air in your lungs. Yeah, no, definitely. And then – you mentioned the whole recruiting and the kind of the bells and whistles these recruits, some of them are looking for here. With the whole likeness and all that other stuff, the NIL and all that, what's your take on all that stuff here nowadays? Like, you know, again, kids are getting paid now. Yeah, I, I think it's good that they're finally getting paid. I'm not sure if that type of payment is what is best because it's about to get crazy. How you so? Know, when you when you hear Nick Saban saying, hey, our quarterback has already have $700,000 under his name and he hasn't even touched the field yet. Mm -hmm. now these kids are going to be coming, and especially the moms and dads are going to be coming and saying, how much is he going to be able to make even mm -hmm. before he gets to the NFL? Mm -hmm. Before is, hey, keep him healthy and help, help him get to the NFL. Now is how much is he going to be making while he's in college, we need this new house. I want a new car. And they're going to be putting more pressure on their own kids to do well and not to be injured and get into that training room and get healthy again. So, you know, you can get these endorsements. Mm -hmm. It's, 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 I don't think it's going to turn out for the best in the long run. I think it's just going to keep getting uglier. Now, interesting you say that. And as you say that, it's kind of like, role reversal here, these 17, 18 year olds becoming head of their households and and still haven't even grown up yet. You know, it's basically right, basically, right. Yeah. yeah. But I, I understand it is tough because you're getting on a bus with a head coach who's on an Aflac commercial. Yes. And yes. he's getting a lot of money. And the ESPN is reporting that he just signed a new 30, 40 million dollar contract. Mm -hmm. So while while he's coaching, but these guys are busting their tail and getting ACLs and all that other stuff on the field. So I understand that part of it for sure. Mm -hmm. I, I always thought years ago that it would be great if they recruited someone and you said, okay, we're recruiting you, 
and the payout is an opportunity to get a degree plus some other money, plus some other money, or you come to our school, you don't go to class, and we just pay you to play for our university. Mm -hmm. Now, after your four years is over, you got money, you go, don't get no degree, but that's what you signed up for. So we don't want to hear any complaints. We're telling you and your parents, either to have a chance to get a degree and play with not as much money, or you, get, you don't get a degree and we pay you more and you leave here without a degree. Interesting. I thought something like that would be worthwhile because you have kids out there who don't want to go to class. Yeah, yeah. Uh, you're right about that. And those, they just play, I mean, what they go to class during the season just to stay eligible, and that's pretty much it, if, if that at all. Yeah. Right. And then they leave and get an agent, and then they start working out for the NFL combine. Mm -hmm. Now, d during your time, as far as did you – were you part of on a recruiting trail a lot, or you just mainly you just stuck with the coaching here, or did you have to go out and? Oh, oh no, no, coaches on the college level, it's all recruiting. You're you better. That's why their coaches are bringing you to their school because they're recruiting. Mm -hmm. So you got to have that gift of gab. You got to make sure you know who their girlfriend's name is, their dog's name, their uncle's name, mm -hmm. who's the influencers in their life, who's going to help them make a decision when their birthday is. Yeah, you know. On, on and on and on. It's a, it's a big, ugly game um, because, again, like you said, you're chasing these 16, 17, 18-year-olds around, and they're, they're bringing you along, and some of them know how to play the game yes. because you want to keep, keep them happy. And it's crazy because you make a mistake and bring a chocolate ice cream cone to their house when they really like mint. And coach, mm -hmm. how do you know I don't like mint? Well, guess what? I'm crossing you off my list. Yeah. I don't like it gets ridiculous when kids are about to announce their school and they have a, a t shirt on and that school is excited that he's gonna sign with them and all of a sudden he rips his shirt off. Yeah. yeah. And that coach who recruited him looks like a fool right now in front of his staff. Mm -hmm. And the head coach is looking at him like, How the hell did you lose him? Mm-hmm. Oh, so the kid can play games with it. When I remember when my son signed, I said, get ready to say who you're going to sign with because you're not going to do anything of this silly nonsense. Right. And the fathers and mothers out there should be doing the same, you know. They should nah. be respectful. They should be respectful to the coaches who recruited them, who he's not going to choose their school. Mm -hmm. No, nah, definitely. What was your – your approach as far as just with these with these um, student athletes? Did you have a certain approach or it vary from kid to kid? Uh, it was always easy because their approach was also always be truthful. Yeah. yeah. If he was going to come to our school and we were going to change his position, tell him. Tell him and their parents that. So mm -hmm. they don't go to your school when you sign him and now the parents are complaining. Coach, you lied. You said he was going to be this position and now you move him to that position. You never going to – and he wanted to play – and, and, you know, it hurts you because the kids end up being sour and having a bad attitude. I've seen it, mm -hmm. you know, and I've seen some of them who went on to play in the NFL, but they were pissed off in college because we changed my position. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, you be truthful with them and the parents and you never have to worry about what you've told them. Yes. Right. And, you... and I, I remember being at West Virginia and I recruited a Jersey kid for West Virginia and the head coach got mad at me with a previous kid because all, everybody else was telling him that his running back was a 1A kid, but nobody was offering him a scholarship. Mm -hmm. He said, well, coach, what do you think about him? I looked at his tape. I said, sorry, but he is not a 1A kid. He's a 1AA kid. And the head coach got mad at me, mm -hmm. made at me. And the kid ended up going to a 1AA school. Well, the next time he had a real 1A player, I came in, looked at the tape. I said, yeah, coach, we, we like him. I showed him to the coaches. We're going to offer him. And I was going to have a home visit with the mom. And he, the coach showed up at the house. And I was like, oh, crap. What, what is he going to say? Because he was pissed off at me when I said his other kid wasn't a 1A kid. But he said whatever the mom's name was, can't remember now. He said, hey, I just want to tell you, 
a couple of years ago, this coach came in and everybody was telling me my running back was a 1A kid and nobody offered him. This was the only coach that came in and said he was not a 1A kid. So when he's sitting in your living room telling me that your son is a 1A kid and can play for his school, he's going to be truthful and telling you the truth. Mm -hmm. Coach spoke up for me to the mom and that kid ended up committing to our school. Yeah. And one so, thing with the truth, you don't never got to remember the truth. You know? that's, that's right. Yeah. Interesting. And even all these transitions and everything, technology, has that helped or, or hurt you uh, during your recruiting times? I mean, I know that everyone has, you know, from followers to all this other stuff to all these different platforms. I mean, it's how getting, did it impact you? It's getting crazy because, yeah. because a kid is going to have a coach following him. You know, if coach, if you don't follow me, I'm probably not going to go to your school, you know, and then they have all these influencers and stuff like that. And one mm -hmm. thing I used to like, I used to like the kids who were just leaders and didn't give a crap about all the other stuff. Yeah. You know, I, I recruited one kid to a division one, a school who didn't wear earrings mm -hmm. at all. And that that's fine. Whether he wanted to wear them or not, that was his business, but he didn't, he was a kid that didn't wear them. And then when he got to our school, one of the first things he did was go and get earrings. And I called him into my office. I said, you know what? what what's, what's up with the earrings? You never wore earrings before. He said, well, coach, everybody here is wearing them. I felt like I had to get them. And I said, man, I thought I was recruiting a leader, yeah. not a follower. Yeah. You don't have to wear earrings because everyone else is there. But he, he felt the pressure of fitting in and being like everybody else. Mm -hmm. You know, and when you're at a big time school, you know, it, it changes people. No, nah, it does. And you, speaking of big time, I even think that even with the, the high school rakes with the IMGs and all of these are like baby colleges, you know. Yeah. 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 How about that place? You know, you can you can lose your your top players and he can go there. Mm hmm. But but it, we we see it in the college level also. You you can have a kid for two or three years and he loves you, and all of a sudden he signs with an agent, and then he stops listening to you. He stops listening to your strength coach because he goes the agent goes out and gets him his own strength coach, mm. and he just I'm going to the NFL. I I need to talk to these people and follow these people. Okay, bye. Mm -hmm. People only have one thing in common with you, and that's they want to make money from you. Yeah, we were the we were the ones who cared about you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so, they don't realize it sometimes till later. Some, now, even with the, all you speaking of the league or what have you, there, I mean, obviously they trace up your ancestors or what have you for each person they're drafted or want, you know, part of their organization. How much, you know, as far as they really value your word on a on a on a on a player or what have you? Because I know sometimes they take your word with a grain of salt. Sometimes they really take what you got to say. I mean, how? My, so yep. my question basically is, how's the league as far as interacting with you or the, or the coaches here? Well, they, they really take the word of what the coaches say, especially if they're, they've dealt with them for years and they trust them. It's the same thing as recruiting. Mm -hmm. Tell the league the truth. Mm -hmm. You know, tell them the truth because they're going to find out. They have, they pay big money to investigate every player that they're interested in. Yes. So when they when the players come out and they give them a information sheet to fill out, put down that you got arrested for smoking pot, because mm -hmm. they either know already, or they're going to find out. Yes, I've yes. had kids who signed free agent contracts who didn't put stuff down there, and then when they found out, they were with NFL teams and got cut because they lied. The teams loved them as a player. Mm -hmm. But they are not going to take a lie. Remember, they're they're paying big time money mm -hmm. for these kids, you know. And um, you know, just like I said, they need to be honest in everything that they do. Whatever you did wrong, go ahead and put it down. Be up front. They'd rather have you be up front and say, "Hey, coach, while we're sitting down, I just want to make sure you knew about four years ago." This happened. This happened. Oh well, thanks for telling me because I need to know that. No mm -hmm. problem. But if they, if you try to cloud something over, cover something over, then um, they're not going to go with that. Yeah, no, it makes sense. And like you says, 
they're investing tons of money into these people. So, I mean, like I said, they're tracing, they trace the ancestors pretty much getting every, you know, nook and cranny they can off these, off these um, soon to be NFL players. So no, I, I totally get it. Right. Now, now with sports here, like, what is it giving you that's, that stuck with you to this day? I know you, you know, from playing the coach and what have you here, is anything just from day one or early on, that's just what sticks with you as far as, you know, that you got through sports? Um, well, first thing is my faith. You know, when I was at East Orange High School, Alan Fields, our head coach, mm -hmm. brought Kaplan for our team, Reverend Bill Iverson. Bill's probably 92 years old right now, maybe 90, just turned 90. But he was our chaplain. So we, when I grew up, I didn't know about God, Jesus, church, nothing. Mm -hmm. And he brought faith into our locker room. Okay. And that, that was that was major for me, as well as my older brother. Um, I think the other thing, again, is just believe in yourself. Because when I was a high school coach, I would travel and visit all these large colleges with the big stadiums and say, one day I'm going to be coaching at one of these places. Okay. Okay. You know, and when you, when you hear about the people again, that came out of East Orange who went on to do well and mm -hmm. have success in all different type of fields, it's like, Hey, why not me? Mm -hmm. Me, if Vinnie Brown could come out of East Orange and be a big part of naughty by nature, you mm -hmm. know, and other people, John Amos, Whitney Houston, Dion Warwick, all the people, right? You know, come out. It's like you you come to realize that what people have said all along: just believe in yourself, mm -hmm. pray. You know, get positive people around you. Don't don't say, use words like "I can't believe that you can do everything." Mm -hmm. and that's why I tell people is even even the kids that I the little kids I help around here at the school and thing. Like, I don't ever want to hear you say, I can't say I can, but how? Please show me. I can, can you do this? Yes, I can do it. Will you show me how to do it? Yes, I'll show you how to do it. Okay, then let's do it. Mm -hmm. Don't don't rule out anything. Don't say yeah. I can't. You cut, there are so many people, so many adults who cut themselves out of so much yes. by just saying, Oh, that's not me. That's not for me. I can't do that. You're right. You can't. You already said it. You already claimed that you can't. That's why you're still in the position that you're in. Mm -hmm. And there's a reason why people are poor and there are a reason why people are rich. Mm -hmm. And the people who are soaring, they have a totally different mindset and they get around other people who have that mindset. So they're learning about this rich mindset where the mm -hmm. people who are broke are hanging out with broke people and they have they are just listening to their own broke brains and that's why they're not moving yeah no definitely i mean you are the company you keep and i think mm -hmm. also too to your point with um coach holtz mentioned as far as you know i'm a miss i'm misquoting it but basically getting those people out of your circle the ones that are just pulling you down or have you i mean that that's that's everyday life lessons that's just not sports it, that's, that's right that's, Right. Yeah, that's 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 everyday life lessons here. So, mm -hmm. uh, yeah, what I normally do, you know, as far as just ask ask some straightforward questions here on and have some fun. Some of you like, what is he asking me? This is totally makes no sense, but you make sense of it and and answer it the best way possible. If that's oh. all right. Oh yeah. Cool, cool. So, uh, obviously, being a Jersey guy here, you are uh, the Turnpike or the Parkway? Parkway, exit exit one forty seven. Oval Park or Wasesson being the East Orange guy? Oval or Wasesson? Wasesson, yes. Oh, the Oval. Okay. As far as um, Main Street or Central Ave? Main. What's the big deal about Main Street? I, I, was sandwiches around when you were? Oh, yeah. Sandwich was around. You know, East Orange was right off of Main Street. Yes, right in the, right, right, right in the back there. You right know. in the back there. Mm -hmm. now, as far as uh, memory, your best memory at Martin Stadium. As far as playing, <laughs> best memory at Martin Stadium was throwing a touchdown pass against Patterson Kennedy to okay. Lance to Lance Jackson and beating them. What was the score of the game? That was the winning touchdown. Uh, I can't remember the score of the game. 
Uh, as a player, I had never beaten Barringer. I was 3-0 and against him as a head coach. Mm -hmm. uh, my glory days was watching my brother and watching the other guys play. Okay. But that was the one game that we won. <laughs> so that's the best memory I remember as a player. Now I know, um, and, and getting an interception as a defensive back against Montclair. Oh, okay. Yeah. Montclair, Banjo, and obviously the Banjo games. You mentioned you said you lost you lost three of those games in high school playing. Uh, as a as a player, I lost two of them, and as a coach, I was I was three and zero against Barringer. So the turkey tastes a little better as a coach. Woo! Turkey was sweet. <laughs> uh, what Keith Hinton used to call it the blue gravy, baby, blue gravy. Yeah, yeah, nah, nah. Rest in peace, Mister Hinton. I, I know Mister Hinton. Yeah, mm -hmm. Me and his son, me and his son are good friends. Okay. Now, I, ironically, you mentioned um coaching too. Uh, just a sidebar here. Actually, I had Shamil and Fabian on here. I was able to get oh. them on here. Yeah, yeah, that yeah. was a, that was a backfield now. Yeah, yeah. They, two times yeah. one thousand yard rusher at Delaware State. Yes, yes, and you yeah. also had you also had Leroy Cooper too, right? Yeah, had Coop. Yeah, yeah, all state. Yeah, I remember him. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Coop was unbelievable. We had Keith Short. Mm -hmm. Had some uh, amazing players there. Now, I even think about it because you had the nice little pipeline to the East Orange Rams. I mean, I know other factors, environmental or academics, played a part, but you. Rams or the Rams. I mean, I mean, we, you know, you hear about them. It's just nothing but athletes, nothing but athletes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. They, they, what hurt East Orange back in the day was when they went to a rule where you could not play unless you had a C average. Mm -hmm. Okay. We had, we had players back in the day who had D averages and went on to junior colleges and played at major universities. Mm -hmm. So then yeah. when they, when they started that rule, it cut out a lot of players who ended up going to the streets mm -hmm. where, where they would normally would have been with us at practice out of trouble. At least they're in high school trying to get their grades and they're going on to junior colleges because you, you can go to junior college with a D average. You know? Right, right. And that that hurt. So whoever made a decision back then hurt a lot of people. Yeah, because to your point, you know, of nothing else outside of the game, just the structure provided and obviously keeping them away from those those things that would tug at them as far as the streets and everything. Nah, I, I totally understand that. Totally mm -hmm. understand that. Now, as far as um, coaching-wise, you prefer coaching in high school or college? College. Best game you ever played as a player first in your life at any level? Uh, best game I ever played was at Gettysburg College against Johns Hopkins. Mm -hmm. My coach put me on an All-American wide receiver. And it was his first game, never scoring a touchdown in the game. And he was an All-American. And I tied the school record with three interceptions. That game? Yes. That game. Wow. Okay. Yeah. Well, you, you, you was a lockdown defender, I see you. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> How about best game you ever coached? Is it one of those games that's like, you know what? I nailed it this game as far as coaching. As far as coaching, I got to say, when I was running back coach at Georgia, we were at Tennessee, and it was about 56 seconds left in the game, and we had the ball. And we put in a play called P44 Haynes because we used to run the sprint draw. And our, my fullback used to block the linebackers for the tailback to come through. Mm -hmm. And on this play, my fullback went to fake the linebacker like he was blocking them. And he slipped right by him and was all alone in the end zone, threw the ball to him over the linebacker's head, and won the game at Tennessee in front of 106,000 people at yeah. Tennessee. That's some crazy stuff. Yeah. Now, when you was at Georgia, who who was your um, your main back? Well, Veron Haynes okay. was the back, and Veron ended up playing with the Pittsburgh Steelers after that. Mm -hmm. Now, did you ever get in awe of another another coach? Just kind of like, hey, I'm on the same field with this person. Eddie Robinson. Understandable. Eddie Rob Completely understandable. 
I mean, what, what a great man, not only a great coach, but at the convention, at our football convention, he used to stay up all night just talking to us. Yes. And we sit there listening to him. And he was great. And he used to tell the big time coaches, why don't you come out of your rooms and let these little coaches feel you, you know, and talk to you and touch you a little bit. But he would stay out all night. And then after he passed away and we played at Grambling, mm -hmm. or Grambling's coaches and team came out, I would go over on Grambling's sideline and walk up and down the sideline just to make sure I stepped in one of Eddie Robinson's footsteps. Wow. Yeah. Now that, that that's magical. And even for you to just say what kind of person he was, just to talk to you guys. I mean, he didn't have to do that. You know. Right. Right. And just for him to just be there spending hours and you guys just soaking up game from him. And I mean, you you can't replace that. You you can't right. replace. It. Yeah. yeah. That was pretty cool. Yeah. Is there a game that you would like to have back? Always, always <laughs> games we like to have back. Always decisions we love to have back. Always games we like to have back. Mm -hmm. you know, gosh. Like to have some of those games back when I was coaching the East Orange. Mm -hmm. We started out, I started out my first year one and one and eight. And then we ended up having our winning season my last year, five and four. Okay. And just beating Livingston was a great feeling, beating Barringer, beating some of those teams that was beating on us a little bit. Mm -hmm. You know, Columbia, things like that. Um You left East Orange when as a head coach. You left them. I left East Orange in 1990. Okay. As a head. Okay. Yeah. No. But, uh, no, go ahead. Go ahead. I was just going to say in college is, uh, man, too many games that you would love to have back to, to remember. Yeah. As far as high school, even during your time when you played here, who's the, um, who's the best high school um, football player you've seen? Well, I don't know if you remember this name, but when we already started, we went down. Well, actually, they came up to play us. Camden Wilson. Cam I heard that name. Camden, New Jersey, down in South Jersey, came up to East Orange and played on our field. Mm -hmm. And a Heisman Trophy winner, Mike Rozier. Mike Rozier went to Nebraska, yes. Went to Nebraska. We played against him. And I'm so sorry that my man Andre Wilson just passed away this past year. Andre was smacking him in the mouth. Andre was a tough, hard-hitting safety. Clemson was looking at him. Mm -hmm. And, uh, boy, but, you know, Mike Rozier and his brother was quarterback and tailback, and they ran all over us. But you just remember Mike Rozier, Quint Quintus McDonald up in Montclair. Uh, yes. Yeah, and, you know, naturally the Barringer boys down there, Norm Granger. Mm -hmm. You know, I tip it was a little bit a couple of years before my time, but. You know, Barringer always had those guys who were going out to Iowa. Iowa always had their hands on the Barringer guys. Yes. And uh, Coach Reducci had a, had a pipeline to Iowa there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Old Coach Reducci. Yeah. Now, as far as um, – this might get you in some trouble, but it's okay. As far as your um, top – I don't know, let's just – I'll say five if you can name five as far as uh, best football players from um, East Orange. From over, out of all time, all time, all time. Oh man, and you're making it hard. We've had so many. You know, you got to put Charlie Hitton in there. Okay. Played, ended up going out and playing at USC. Um, I'm forgetting my offensive lineman who played in Nebraska. Okay. Guys, Hall, Ron Hall. No, guys, he'll come to me. Um. Jesse Butts was somebody I idolized ever since I was a kid. Mm -hmm. So I got to throw his name in there. Um, someone that I knew personally, I used to love and still a great friend is Clarence Turner. Mm -hmm. um, CT, we called him my brother, naturally my brother, all state linebacker, Jerome Pierce. And he played with Steve Shaw and Wayne Benson. And boy, they were stacked at Lindsey Adams and, just some great players that year. Mm -hmm. So, but but overall, just too many names out there. You know, Coach nah, Steve, know. Steve Cowens and um, 
On and on and on. Uh, now that's the fun of it. I mean, you leave somebody out. It's okay. It's okay. Uh huh. You feel um. You feel you got your just do. I have no regrets. Mm -hmm. Way to look at it. Definitely. What's uh? What are you most proud of? Uh, my kids. Mm -hmm. Proud of what they've done. You know, being a West Point graduate, Air Force Academy graduate. My daughter being a law Georgia Law School graduate. Mm -hmm. I was proud of them. Yeah. And, um, you know, you look back and see all the players, what they're doing with their families now and with their kids, Tariq Waters, Fabian, mm -hmm. you know, all the guys who have their families right now, Jamal Williamson, who's a principal right now at a high school or junior high school, mm -hmm. uh, Leon Booper, you know, he's running his own business. Yes. You know, look back and Ar Artie Williams, who I believe was police, police officer, sergeant, detective, something like that. Just, just happy for the guys going on and doing well. And, um, you know, you just keep moving on and letting them know that, hey, it's not over for old Coach Pierce yet. You may see me grinding on the dance floor one day, mm -hmm. you know. <laughs> that's right. That's right. What's up? Speaking of uh, Coach Pierce, what's the best part about being Tony Pierce? Mm, knowing that. When I was back in high school, I went down in the basement of my home, opened up a Bible and accepted Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior. Mm -hmm. And knowing he's not a white Jesus, he's not a black Jesus, he's just Jesus. Mm -hmm. Nah, nah, good stuff here. And, and speaking of it all, Tony Pierce here, what would this Tony Pierce tell that, that senior year, Tony Pierce? What advice would you give him? My senior year in high school? Yeah, what would this Tony Pierce get, get home and do your homework? Okay. Get home and do your homework. You could have gotten into more colleges mm -hmm. if you would have done your homework and stopped trying to hang out so much. Mm -hmm. And ah, that's, yeah. that's what I tell. And, and my last one, as far as in, within your immediate family, you're the best athlete? No, no, my older brother, my son. Jordan. Okay. okay. It's in my immediate family. Mm -hmm. nice. It's been Jerry, my brother graduated from Dartmouth in 1981. Mm -hmm. And probably that's what, 80, well, 40 years? Yes. No one has still broken his all time leading tackler record. Yeah. There were games, there were games that he had 30 tackles in the game and or more. Yeah. I mean, he was all over the field. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's amazing. To your point with the rich history of East Orange and with them being combined now, you know, um, for that to still stand, yeah, that, that's amazing. No, that that's at Dartmouth. That's not at East Orange. Okay. Okay. Yeah, he, he's the all-time leading tackler at Dartmouth. Mm -hmm. In 40 years, no one has passed his record. Yeah. And how competitive that league is from the Princetons to everything else, yeah. Yeah, that mm -hmm. says something. Mm -hmm. that, I, that I definitely said something. Coach, I just wanted to tell you, like I said, I'm just taking back this even this little bit of time. Just um, I know you know been all over the, like I said, you know, the United States coaching or what have you there. And I can only imagine outside of, you know, you know, husband, father, you know, brother, son, just to hear the word coach from your your former players here probably makes your heart melt and in particularly as far as what those who are doing and, you know, just a little bit of a role that you played in their lives here, you know, so, and I know I, I say this about coaches and I heard just a while back ago, you engrave your name in the hearts of, I say kids or young adults, you live forever. You know, I heard that about coaches, you know, you, you live forever. Yeah. So, you know, well, I just want to say thank you for all that you, that you've done and you, sh you know, those who do listen to this could just realize like, that kid from Maple and East Orange, you know, can go see the world, you know, yeah. only if you you just open your mind up and just take that first step, you know, and that's yeah. what you did. I mean, you went off to college, you know, the pastures of Gettysburg, whatever. I don't know. I, I won't get into if you cow tipped or not, you know, if you <laughs> cow tipping or anything. But uh, but again, but just to just leave the city to go out there and the next thing, you know, you off living your life here and just, you know, a lot of things have come your way, you know, but that didn't come without the work, hard work and sacrifice as well, too. And um, I just want to say thank you. And even just to hear your second acts, 
you know, um, no pun intended as far as, you know, acting and life mm-hmm. insurance shit, like, you know, you're just getting started, you know, it's like you're getting started all over again, just reinventing yourself and, and your breath of fresh air, just me sitting here. And even when we spoke on the phone here, like, it's just, just, you just reap a positive positivity. And I mean, if somebody can't take something from your head, you know, they must've been deaf or something, not listening to you. So um, I just wanted to say thank you coach, just for the opportunity to sit here and talk to me and everything here. You being officially you will help me or be officially me one way or another here. Cause like I said, you're a breath of fresh air and just, you know, um, positivity and everything else here. Like I said, I'm totally, you know, just flattered by this time. Well, I appreciate you for having me on, for considering me for your show and make sure that you give Sturdivant my number. Oh, no, I'm on it. I'm, I'm definitely on it. Like I said, he right there. He's right in Atlanta. So y'all next. <laughs> and, you, and you know you have a bunch of you... Athens, Georgia. Okay, no, absolutely. Like, yeah, you're right there. So that, that's not a problem. And obviously, he, you know his uncle. So not a problem. Not All a problem. Right. No, I'll definitely do that. And then we'll, uh, we'll talk, Coach. And be well. And blessings to you and your family, sir. All right, Evan. See you now. All right. All right. Take care. Bye-bye. All right. Good stuff. Good stuff. You know, I meant what I said as far as just a breath of fresh air and positivity here. Like I said, it, um, show ain't over till it's over. I mean, just reinventing yourself. I mean, but just those streets of East Orange, playing sports, whatever the case may be here. I know, you know, it's just, you know, sometimes I just get speechless because it's just great to just, you know, just have these opportunities to meet people and to talk to individuals that I thought I would never in my life talk to here. So, um. I'm, I'm very grateful, and I just thank everybody who checks me out here. But that being said, I'm going to just slide out on this. I put my hand over my heart. That means I feel you. Yeah.